And I want you to biblically try to discern this, try to answer this. Revelation, I hope, no matter what your eschatological view or view of the end times might be, I hope everybody is very, very comfortable with the fact that Revelation is a very symbol-laden book. It is rich with symbolism. I'll just give you an example. Look at Revelation chapter 5. If you went to 14, just back up to 5. Because I, I, we, we read this. George read this for us on Sunday. And we almost, we almost don't even re realize or recognize at times. Like uh, if you're just looking for symbolism. Um, there's lots of it here, probably far more than, than we want to take time to look at. But in 5.5, 5, Revelation 5.5, 5, one of the elders said to me, I think it's very likely that the elders themselves are symbolic. It says, he says, weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, none of us have a problem with the fact that that's symbolism. Christ is not an actual lion. The root of David. He's obviously not actually a root. Symbolism. And as we continue to read, verse 6, Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb. Well, he's not actually a lamb. Symbolism again. As though it had been slain with seven horns. Symbolism. Seven is a number of perfection. Seven is God's number, seven days in a week. There's seven horns. A horn, we could prove all over the scripture, is symbolic of strength. This lamb has perfect strength. And he has seven eyes. Again, that's symbolic. A lamb with seven eyes is, would be hideous. But the seven eyes mean something. They mean that this lamb not only has omnipotence, but omniscience, all-knowing, can see everything, eyes, seven eyes. And notice, the symbolism just keeps going. The seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. Well, since when is there not one spirit of God? Again, very symbolic language. Anyway, I, I hope you're all comfortable with the symbolic nature of revelation. This, this, is, so, this is so typical of uh, uh, apocalyptic or prophetic. I mean, you, when you go back and look at the Old Testament prophets, we often get this kind of apocalyptic language. And so it really shouldn't surprise us. But now I want to go to Revelation 14, where the question stems from. So I, I kind of I wanted to establish just something of the symbolic nature of the book because when we come over here, we're going to see symbolism again. Chapter 14 of Revelation. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000. Now, again, this is an extremely symbol laden number. The Jehovah's Witnesses want to say, well, there's 144,000, and they're the only ones who are actually going to heaven. Everybody, all the rest of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to remain here on this earth. Well, a lot of people have done crazy things with this number. But think of the significance. Twelve tribes is extremely significant of the Old Testament. Twelve apostles the significance of this, these two twelves comes up over and over. When you multiply twelves times twelve, you get 144. When you take that out, I mean, you think of the scripture. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. 
I mean, the, the idea of a thousand is very, again, it's, it's, it's almost, well, it's, it's a symbolic representation. It does, it's not to be taken literal. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, there's more than a thousand hills on the face of the earth, but it's, it's thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I mean, the, the idea of thousand is, it's a real emphasis. And so to have 12 times 12 to the, to the multiplier of a thousand is a very symbolic representation for the entire church, Old and New Testament. And these are the ones who are with Christ. And they have Christ's name. And they have the Father's name written on their foreheads. You see, in the book of Revelation, this is over against the mark of the beast, 666, which is on the foreheads of those who are followers of the beast and worshipers of the beast. It's on their hands. It's on their foreheads. It's a number that marks the hand. That's what we do things with. The head, that's where we think. It's got to do with the works and the thoughts of a person. 666, that's falling short of seven. The lamb has seven horns, seven eyes. Man is is falls short of perfection. He falls short of the glory of God. Six to the multiple, I mean, six to the third power, like holy, 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 six, six, six. Man falls short, falls short, falls short. Where the people of God, they have on their foreheads the name of Christ. You see, this is the church here, none, none other. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. You see it again. We are the ones redeemed from the earth. Again, it's the whole church. You really want to see the whole church in this symbolism of 144,000. It is those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And Jesus said to this, he said this, follow me. Isn't that what it says in 1 John? It says that if we say we know him, we're to be these people that follow him. It says it right there in the beginning verses of chapter 2 of 1 John. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. Brethren, the blamelessness has everything to do with our justification. The lie. Well, liars find their place in the lake of fire. The thing is, God gives us a new tongue. He redeems us. But the question here is this. Virgins. The virgin language. They have not defiled themselves with women. Now, you know, if you're, if you're Roman Catholic, you could say, well, see, you know, look, brethren, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. The Bible says that those who forbid to marry, that's demon doctrine. That in, in the later days, I mean, we're going to have we're going to have people that are coming along teaching things that, that are not, nothing else than inspired by demons. Forbidding marriage, forbidding certain foods. That's not the idea here. The idea is that these people are spiritual virgins. Because that's the question. Is this meant both literally and figuratively? Well, we have a very symbol-laden book. I take this as being spiritual. It's symbolic language. And it, it coordinates, it's so consistent with exactly what Paul says to the Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And brethren, I hope this is an encouragement because you have to remember who's being spoken to here. These are the Corinthians. The Corinthians that at times were so backward. 
They had to be rebuked about sexual sin. They had to be rebuked about idolatry, rebuked over their lack of unity, rebuked over not waiting for each other for the Lord's Supper, rebuked because you obviously had women that were out of control in the church. You had people suing each other. This, this church had some real issues. And yet for all that, notice what's said here in 2 Corinthians 11. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now you think about these people. Do you remember what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Don't be deceived because you have all sorts of effeminate and homosexuals. You have the adulterers, the fornicators, all manner of sexual immoral people. Don't be deceived. They don't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Such were some of you. But you know what? They, they weren't anymore. What he says of all of them is, I betrothed you. Remember what betrothal is. It's, it's a lawful, legal, legally binding engagement. You know about betrothal. Mary was betrothed to Joseph when she conceived. You know about this. We have been betrothed to one husband. This has to do with our spiritual union to Christ. And what's he wanting to do? Present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So there's no doubt about the fact that this, this is a spiritual reality. But isn't it a glorious one? Brethren, no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of defiled past you have, can you once again be regarded by the Lord as being pure, as being a virgin? Absolutely. In fact, that's what we're being prepared for. That's what the blood of Christ does. It washes the guilt mm -hmm. away. It makes us pure. It makes us virgin. It makes us undefiled. And in the spiritual realm, our greatest, our greatest spiritual fornication, you think about how often the Israel in the Old Testament was called a whore, whoredom. Hosea, over and over, uses that term, whore. Do you know what their crimes were not primarily sexual sin? There was that, but their whoredom primarily had to do with going after other gods. Man is a whore by nature. Man will bow down to every imaginable idol. I mean, we will go after money. We'll go, we go after self, self-image, self-esteem. We want to make self into God. We will chase drugs. We will chase everything, sex. We'll chase TV. We'll chase movies. We chase, we'll chase everything. We're just, men are, are, they're natural idolaters because God has wired us to love something. God has desired us to worship. God has desired us to find awe in something. We'll chase it in sports. We'll chase it in our hobbies. And man is a whore. And salvation is about making virgins. I mean, our great, you know, a man can, a man can get saved or a woman can get saved and say, well, you know, I, I was never with a man or I was never with a woman. Yeah, but that doesn't mean we weren't whores because our, listen, the first commandment, the first two commandments have nothing to do with our relationship with man. They have everything to do that the very first and foremost things that God would have us to know in the 10 commandments have to do with having no other God before him, not having idols before which we bow down. And our idols today are not wooden statues. They tend to be everything under the sun, motorcycles and cars and houses and beauty and fitness 
and food. And I mean, you, it, you know, you know what it, I mean, when somebody loves something more than God, when somebody worships something aside from God, they worship their job, they worship an animal, their dog. I mean, how many people make gods out of their dogs or they make gods out of their children They make gods out of their spouses or their partners. Uh, they make gods out of science. I mean, brethren, we, we, man, his natural self is, is, he's a spiritual, he's, he's, he's spiritually unfaithful spiritually dirty, spiritually unclean, spiritually given himself to another husband. God is, God is our creator. And we turn against him. We turn our heart against him. And God sees it. Do, do you recognize marriage is the shadow? When a man's not faithful to his wife or a wife isn't faithful to her husband, that's the shadow. When, when a, a man or a woman are not faithful to God, that's the real thing. That's the true whoredom of which marriage and sexual immorality on the physical scope is only but a shadow. The real thing has to do with the fact that we have a God that is very jealous of our love, our affection, our worship. The very fact that men have dishonored God by choosing broken cisterns. Isn't that it? Man has committed two evils. Isn't that what Jeremiah tells us? I mean, the fact is, he exchanges God for these broken cisterns that don't satisfy. What a, what a, what a wretched, I mean, we, he is the very fountain of living waters. And we say, no, we th I think, well, I'll try this broken cistern over here. And you know what? When it leaves me empty, I keep trying it. Isn't it amazing? Drugs leave somebody empty. They keep going back. Sex leaves somebody empty. They keep going back. Gambling leaves somebody empty. They keep going back. The, the party life leaves somebody empty. They wake up Sunday morning. They just feel empty and they go back to it. What a, what a, what a case man is. And then if, if that one doesn't work, he'll, he'll try another one. Keep, he just keeps going to the broken cisterns. That is, that is spiritual whoredom. That is playing the harlot. And so what happens when we get saved is all that guilt that man hardly even knows he's committed. Oh, he knows when he's cheated on his wife. But man hardly even senses when he's cheated on God. And yet, which is the greater crime? Which is the greater commandment? To love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? Or to love our neighbor as ourselves? Man is so misguided. And the reason is we're so, because we love ourselves, we love man. We, we're very humanistic. We have very high views of man and very low views of God. And so we don't, we tend not to think right. Oh, what a, brethren, if you're saved, if you're under the blood, think about this. It's not just that you've been granted access to God. We go before him to whom we're betrothed. We're betrothed. And we go as pure virgins. And you know what Jesus said to his father? You remember how he prayed in John 17? My desire is that they might be where I am and see, behold my glory. I'll tell you this. We're virgins and we've been betrothed. But the wedding day is coming. And oh, what is it going to be like in that day when he takes us in his arms and the marriage is, is absolutely consummated and set in motion for eternity? <laughs> we, can't even, we can't even grasp it. And the, and the entire fullness of the immeasurable riches of God's grace and kindness is poured out upon us through all the coming ages. Brethren, I'll tell you this. You don't want to miss being a Christian. This thing is so glorious. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to come short. 
This, these are the glories of salvation. So this is a very good question. I mean, when I see questions about, are, are we virgins? Oh, you better believe we are. The blood of Christ has made us so. No matter if you were a filthy prostitute, like one woman I've been reading about, filthy prostitute, she was a witch, she was into Satan worship. They did the most foul, disgusting, wicked, and she's, uh, and what's so amazing is that the guy that, the guy that God used so prominently in her life, um, he pastored at West Houghton, as I was telling some of you about just recently, his name is Arthur Neal, and his name's there on the plaque in West Houghton as, as being the pastor there from 1949 to 1953. And he was so prominently used in the, in the life of this woman. And after all the foul, wicked things she did, or you think about Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons were cast. You think about the life she lived, going around demon-possessed, Think about some of these, Jesus said it, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they go into the kingdom before you, he said to the Jewish leaders. And they're just, they're washed clean. Revelation 7, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Yeah, and believe me, our robes were dirty. 